Hey guys, this is Mr. Roxy coming at you live from Palm Beach in Florida. It is Thursday. It is May the 12th. It's already 10 days, uh, sorry, two days after uh, Roxy had reported on May the 10th. Um, it was a good quarter. Uh, it wasn't a blowout quarter like I expected, but it was pretty good. I have not had uh, an opportunity to uh, to read through um, the 8K and the 10K and um, some of the filings, the uh, transcript of the earnings call. So I don't want to give you um, uh, misinformation or um, be superficial about it. So give me a bit of time to uh, to kind of go through that. And maybe I'll make a follow up uh, just to talk a little bit about Oxy specifically. What I want to do today, though, is kind of um, touch on what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, but before I do that, uh, we can talk a little bit about Oxy. I'm just going to sort of touch on the highlights real as it relates to uh, to Occidental. Um, but what I want to do uh, and, and what I sort of challenged myself to do uh, was to come up with 10 ways in which you can recession proof your investment portfolio. Now, uh, when I say challenge, uh, you know, anytime I say uh, 10 ways that you can recession proof your uh, portfolio, it kind of requires a bit of thought because the first one or two or three might come easy. And then you go like, wait a minute, I have to sort of also make this uh, ger general enough to, to fit the audience, right? So um, anyway, I'll, I'll share that with you at the end for now. Let's take a quick look here uh, just at Oxy. Um, today it closed at about uh, $59 or so. I took the screenshot earlier. I don't, I don't remember what time it was. Uh, a couple of things that are interesting um, to share here. Uh, Oxy, despite the fact that it's pulled back about 10% from its all-time high, is still trading pretty much near its all-time high. At, uh, just below this, uh, on this green circle here, you can see it's 10.4% below that all-time high. So it's actually holding okay. Uh, it arguably would be doing much, much better if it hadn't been for the fact that the entire market tanked. So, um, you know, that's just where we are and these things happen. Uh, in the middle of the screen here, the PE ratio, 28.89, so almost 30. Uh, a little bit rich in terms of its current valuation, uh, but actually, to be fair, it has room to run uh, and your PE ratio should never be the only benchmark that you uh, base your investment decisions upon. The uh, dividend has been increased a little, so that's looking pretty good. The institutional invest investors now are uh, over 80%, uh, thanks mainly to uh, Warren Buffett. But you can see the short interest has also uh, gone up a little. It was hovering at around 3% for um, several months, and now it's uh, back up to over 5%. So there are people uh, who are basically betting on this pullback and trying to make some money that way. Uh, as you know, I don't day trade. So I'm just talking about long positions when I share information with you. Anyway, the reason why I added this big fat green arrow here on the uh, right hand side of the screen is because if you have a stock that has a chart that looks like this compared to the uh, S&P 500, then you are probably in a pretty good position. And uh, to be fair, stocks like these are a hedge against market crashes. So right now the market is crashing, but if you um, had been with me for the past couple of years and invested in Oxy along the way, and you're still holding it, you probably are okay. Uh, because remember, one or two positions in your portfolio that provide you with uh, you know, 10X, we're not there on Oxy, but a 10X or a 20X, one, just one or two of those can right size your entire portfolio. Let's take a look here at uh, Oxy in terms of their cash flow priorities and make a mental note of this because I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the, uh, the video. De-risk complete, right? They pretty much have done balance sheet repair. The deleveraging is continuing. So near term, repay $5 billion of debt. They wanna get the debt into the high teens. That would be phenomenal. It would be fantastic. Reducing the net debt to 20 billion or thereabout. Currently they're at the end of, uh, as of the end of March, um, Oxy's long-term debt is sitting at around 27 billion. Uh, but of course we're midway already through the second quarter. And they probably knocked a little bit of a dent in that one already because they're quite confident that they can get their debt down to 20 billion or maybe even into the high teens. Medium term, reduce the gross debt to high teens with the objective of regaining investment grade credit ratings. That would be great, not only for reducing the debt, but also if you have investment grade, as soon as you get to IG credit rating level, you also pay less for the uh, borrowings that you might need to do going forward and in the future. Return of capital in progress, and of course, there's this $3 billion share repurchase program that is going to be starting soon. The highlights for the quarter, $3.3 billion free cash flow, another record. 
$3.3 billion of debt retired, phenomenal job, great stuff. And the uh, adjusted EPS, $2.12 on earnings per share. Uh, the analyst estimates were um, around, I think the median was $1.97. My personal estimate was $2.25, so uh, oxy missed, but uh, pretty good performance anyway in that regard. A couple of notes here. Uh, the first uh, from CFR Stuart Blickman. Oxy is trading at five times higher than two years ago. Remember that? You could buy Oxy for 12 bucks and now it's trading at 60. So it's five times higher than two years ago. They've improved the health of the balance sheet, as I just shared with you. Oxy is 90% of the way towards its stated goal of cutting debt by $5 billion and CFRA's new 12 month target uh, of $70 is up five bucks, which is obviously a six times multiple on enterprise value to project the 2023 EBITDA. Susquehanna's Bijou Berin Cerro says Oxy remains positive and he raised the target price from 71 to $73. I'm going to wrap it up on Oxy there because I want to talk a little bit about this sort of macro thesis as it relates to the market. And um, the first thing we're going to look at is the VIX. So the VIX is kind of also commonly called the, the uh, fear index, but the VIX is really the volatility index as um, tracked by the Chicago Board of Exchange. So right at the top of the page where it says VIX, underneath that it says index, CBOE, that's the Chicago Board of Exchange. Currently sitting at around 33. Now the VIX in uh, March 2020, when we learned about the uh, coronavirus pandemic, it's 66, which is super high. Uh, right now it is high and it's trending up, but it's sort of flatlining in, an, in a range here of sort of in the mid twenties to the thirties. Uh, we watch this and I, for one, watch this every single day. So one of the first things I do uh, every day is take a look at the futures and then I take a look at the VIX and then I take a look at some of my equity positions and I do this every single day. Yeah, I'm addicted, that's what I do. Wall Street slide continues with the S&P 500 edging closer to bear market territory. In fact, it's right there right now. Wall Street sell-off was triggered. I don't like the word sell-off. There's always someone on the other side of every trade. It's not like everybody that I know. In fact, uh, you can tell me if you've sold all your stock, but if you've been selling off your stock, remember someone on the other side of the equation is buying. Uh, so the sell-off was triggered by concerns about rising inflation and interest rates. This is a very real threat, right? So I've been talking about the rising inflation, not so much the rising inflation per se, but I've mentioned hyperinflation probably in 10 videos. And I talked about it as the inflation rate was going up, up, up. And don't be fooled by stupid numbers like the Fed or um, you know, government officials saying, uh, especially the Fed though, uh, you know, the target rate, they want to get it back down to about three or whatever, and it's currently about six, and they say it's spiking, looking like it's about eight. That, that is not the right thing to look at, because when you look at the uh, inflation, what you need to do is look at the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index. If you look at the Consumer Price Index, instead of looking at the inflation rate as it's published by the Fed, uh, the difference there is that the Consumer Price Index specifically uh, ranks or rates the, uh, the index based on the things that we consume on an ongoing basis, like gasoline for your car, petrol, food, et cetera. And you know, the fact of the matter is this, two years ago in the United States where I lived, um, two years ago, uh, a gallon, which is about four liters of gasoline was about two bucks. And now it's about $4.30, $4.25. That's a hundred percent up. So uh, when the Fed says, well, we wanna you know, make sure inflation doesn't go much beyond six or whatever, it's like, get out of here. Just talking rubbish. The S&P 500, uh, the chart doesn't look too good, but here's another hedge, right? So one of the hedges I just shared with you was Oxy itself, because you have a, a stock that's basically got a 5X over a two-year period. And if you look at the sector performance, you certainly did not want to be in consumer discretionary information technology, communication services, or whatever. If you were parked somewhere up at the top here and you included energy, you're probably okay. In fact, even today, after pullbacks in the market, energy is still kind of holding because the energy price hasn't really tanked much, regardless of all the stuff that they've been doing, including um, Biden's release of the strategic petroleum reserve. Um, stupid stuff, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, we still have WTI and Brent at over $100 a barrel. So uh, whatever they did failed, and uh, it's going to keep failing because they have no idea what they're doing. And the Fed increasing the rates is uh, potentially even going to put... Uh, us into a recession, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The sell-off in 2022 was triggered by concerns about rising inflation 
and interest rates, the sell-off in 2022, this is where we are right now, comes after the S&P 500 rallied 90% in the previous three years. That's a hedge in itself, right? If you get a 90% rally, uh, that means ma many of your stocks, if you had held them long, uh, almost doubled. So you have a nice little buffer built in for when it pulls back. And remember, what goes up will come down. And right now, it's coming down. It was triggered by concerns about rising inflation and interest rates. Pay careful attention to uh, what I'm sharing with you here, because there's a lot of noise in the media about stuff that um, matter, but don't matter as much as what they say it matters. And I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying that they try to distract you with different things every single day. The fact of the matter is this current um, recessionary environment that we're in now is all about rising inflation and now rising interest rates. The sell-off, by the way, has also impacted cryptocurrencies and metals. Metals have pulled back too, including raw materials like uh, copper. Interesting stuff. For equity investors, I think that's all of us, the inflation data is impacted by how aggressively the Fed will raise interest rates. And there's more to come, right? So uh, we're going to see that in just a second year, the higher borrowing costs, higher borrowing costs in general, will slow growth and dampen interest in riskier investments. Well, this is the opposite of the past almost 10 years, because in the past 10 years, money was so cheap that you could borrow for next to nothing and then just buy all kinds of risky assets and get involved in all kinds of um, margin calls and things that you probably shouldn't have been in. Uh, but for the majority of us probably listening to this video, you might be um, you know, long in, in positions. I hope you didn't uh, borrow money to buy some of those positions long. Uh, but you know, uh, really what you want to do is be very, very cautious when interest rates start going up, especially for instance, if you buy more house than what you can afford. By the way, the reason why I have a US flag at the top of the uh, presentation here is because much of the information that I'm sharing with you is US specific. I know I'm speaking to a global audience, but uh, you know the old cliche is when the United States sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold, and that is what we're seeing right now. Fortunately, it's not a COVID cold, but the United States is starting to sneeze repeatedly, and the rest of the world is catching that same cold. At the bottom of the screen here, until we get a handle on when the Fed um, on what the Fed is doing, actually. It raised its benchmark a half a percentage point earlier this month. Uh, and you can see the effect that that has had on the market. And the Fed is expected to do so again when it meets in June and July. So uh, it's going to be interesting how the Fed responds uh, to the market crash, because at the end of the day, they don't really care too much about the market. They are trying to uh, all in inflation. But every time they uh, raise the rates, you can expect your equities to drop and drop some more. If you look at the sectors, this is another way that you could potentially hedge because what you want to do is do some due diligence and make sure that you pick not necessarily the right sectors, but certainly good ones, right? So I, I'm highlighting two for you here because they are complete bookends uh, on opposite ends of the scale. Uh, there's nothing that I buy as a general rule when I go long on a stock for six months or even a year. I, I typically have a longer outlook than that and very frequently it's three to five years. So now when I look at energy, over three years, you look at the sector performance, 13 and then 40, thanks last year, uh, you know, 2021 was pretty good. Six months, 15% is still positive, right? There's not too many green uh, rows under the six month column. But look at information technology. If you follow the same methodology and, and investment philosophy, for instance, I'm not, I'm not picking on Kathy Wood here, but I wanna mention her because uh, the ARC Innovation Fund is down a lot. And um, many of the stocks, which were high flying stocks in 2020, were crashers in 2021 and 2022. But look at information technology as a sector. Three years ago, it was delivering 86%. I mean, you just couldn't stop this juggernaut. Remember when uh, your favorite TV uh, guy, Jim Cramer, I said yours, not mine, uh, was talking about Fang every single day, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. And then he called it Fang with a double A, which uh, included. Apple, so Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Oh man, you're in a world of hurt if you went that route instead of uh, hedging with some energy because energy was just slowly creeping up. And if people didn't take notice, they lost money. How about economic expansions by duration? So this in theory is another hedge. We've just had a bullish cycle here of almost 10 years, right? More than 10 years where you had an economic expansion. And um, when you have this kind of a situation happening, then everybody looks like a genius, right? So uh, when you're in the stock market and you're picking stocks, 
And like I've said before, especially when it comes to energy stocks, you could almost throw a dart at a list of stocks and pick them that way because energy was that obvious in terms of being uh, a top performer over the last uh, year or so, especially when it came from that negative uh, futures that it traded in, and I think it was in April, 2020, right? It was ridiculous. You could almost pick any energy stock and you would have made money. But over and above that, we had a bullish cycle here of more than 10 years. So every single person who's in stocks says like, hey, I'm a genius, look how smart I am until it pulls back, like what we're seeing now. There are a couple of things that you can do. And remember, I said I made a, a sort of a generic list of 10 things which I'm going to share with you at the end of this video. Look at this horrible picture here. Consumer debt continues to grow. Why does consumer debt continue to grow? Because money is cheap. Money is almost free. That's an absolutely epic failure by the Fed, supported by the government of the United States. If you make free money available, somewhere along the line, the bubble is going to pop. But it doesn't matter which age group you're in, from 18 to 29, all the way to 70 years plus, even though those two eight groups are at the bottom of this graph here, everybody effectively was taking on more and more consumer debt. And the guys who took on the most are the people who are sort of at the uh, height uh, and the, probably the highest earnings level that they could possibly be in, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59. So between the ages of 30 and 60, these guys took on the most debt. And some of the debt is consumer debt, which is completely absolutely utterly ridiculous like buying too much house or more house than what you need simply because based on low interest rates you can afford it buying flashy cars right i always joke when the market goes up and the market goes down especially when it goes down i usually start the video with one maserati two maseratis right if you can buy them cash it's fine if you're buying them on credit that's a stupid thing to do it's the most silly thing that you could possibly do even worse than that is credit card debt if you are carrying credit card debt, that's the highest interest rate you could possibly pay. Get rid of it as soon as you possibly can and do whatever you can in order to minimize or remove any credit card debts that you have. So are we in a recession? The National Bureau of Economic Research, and once again, this is US specific, that's why the little flag is there. I'm not uh, trying to be a, a patriot in terms of US news, but I'm sharing information that is mostly US centric and then it may be applicable to you or not you decide. Defines a recession, the so NBER defines a recession as a significant decline in econ economic activity spread across the economy, lasting more than a few months. It used to be two quarters, now they say more than a few months. Like literally, they used to define a recession as two quarters of negative growth. Now they say decline lasting more than a few months, normally visible in real GDP. GDP is gross domestic product, real income, employment, industrial pollution, uh, sorry, <laughs> same thing, industrial production and wholesale retail sales. The NBER officially declared an end to the economic expansion in February of 2020 as the United States fell into a recession amid the coronavirus pandemic. However, that 2020 recession was the shortest on record and ended only two months later in April 2020. 2020. Sorry, that's a typo at the bottom of the screen there. According to the NBER, the 2020 recession at the time of the uh, coronavirus pandemic was the shortest on record ending only two months later in April 2020. Why am I sharing this with you? Because currently, if we are going into a recession, and some will argue we are already in a recession, it may not last two months, it may last two years or even longer. Are you set up for this? Are you protected and hedged against it? You don't have to go buy insurance in terms of edges and many things that you can do. I've already shared a couple of things with you as we go. According to the NBER, there have been 34 recessions in the United States since 1854. And the most recent recession was in 2020. Since 1980, so a little bit closer, 2020, 20, uh, now 2022, so 42 years, there have been five such periods. So they're not too frequent, right? But they happen in relative uh, succession. So if we talk about 80 to now, that's 40 years. And over 40 years, there have been five. So there's one literally every eight years. We've just been through a bullish cycle that lasted more than 10 years. So we are due for a recession. Um, Well-known examples of the, of the recession and then followed by depression include the global recession in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, the Great Depression of the 1930s that started in 1929. I think you're all familiar with that. Depression is a deep and long-lasting recession. So it's pretty much the same thing. It just lasts for longer. 
hopefully we can avoid another depression, but we are for sure looking like we are going to have a recession. And hopefully also it'll be relatively short lived, even if it takes several months or a year in order for it to correct. There's no specific criteria to define a depression, but take a look at this. During the 30s, unique features of the depression included a 33% decline in the quantity of goods and services provided and 80% stock market loss. Can you handle that? Are you good? You can take an 80% loss, are you sure? And a 25% unemployment rate. These are terrible things. We hope we don't see anything like that and certainly not anytime soon. What causes a recession? There's so many economic theories, right? And there's so much stuff going on. And that's why I said you shouldn't get distracted by most of the things that are happening around you. But the real economic factors and financial factors, psychological factors, like how, how do people feel about the market, right? I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm gonna sell my stock, cash out and just take the losses. Things like that impact the market. And some theories that bridge the gap between these different factors. Real changes and structural shifts help to explain when and how economic recessions occur. For example, it could be a sustained spike in oil prices. Does that sound familiar? I'm sure it does. Or sustained low lending rates. Does that sound familiar? I'm sure it does. A geopolitical crisis. Well, I'm sure we have a few of those, right? Not just one, quite a few, in fact. But when you look at this, you say, right now, we actually have all three of them at the same time. A sustained spike in oil prices for more than a year already. Sustained low lending rates, money is cheap and it has been for several years already. And geopolitical crisis, not just the latest one, but ongoing geopolitical crises. That means we are ripe for a recession. I remember the slide that I showed you earlier on. A couple of things here, de-risk, de-leverage and return of, return of capital. So this is Oxy. How about you? Have you de-risked your investment investments in your portfolio? Or are you just sitting there hoping that things will get better? There are many, many things that you can do. And in my library, there are quite a number of uh, videos where I talk about uh, risk mitigation uh, and give you some hints and tips on things that you might want to do. Uh, of course, the, the golden rule is uh, let's not lose money. That's rule number one. And rule number two is don't forget rule number one. How about deleveraging? Well, I talked about that, right? If you've taken on stupid debt, then do some smart things and get out of that stupid debt. So effectively, what I'm saying to you is you can follow the same methodology here that Vicky Hollop at Occidental and her team of managers are doing at Occidental to right size the ship as it relates to Occidental Petroleum. You must de-risk your investment portfolio. You should deleverage if you've taken on too much debt or expensive debt, uh, manage it and get rid of it if you can. How about a return on capital, a return of capital? Have you returned some capital to yourself? Have you cashed out some of your profits? Maybe put some cash in the bank and kept some powder dry for when um, maybe we get close to a bottom and you can pick up some cheap shares again. Maybe, right? So the things that apply to Occidental Petroleum apply to you too. And this is the uh, kind of teaser that I shared with you at the beginning of the video. So uh, I said, you know, anytime I, I kind of challenge myself with 10 tips, I write the first couple of, uh, you know, tips, the first two, three, sometimes five of them quite easily. And then I'd be like, hmm, now what? Right? But I offered 10, so here's 10. Stay calm and stay and get healthy. This is the most important uh, information that I could possibly share with you. Don't panic, just stay calm. The market is crashing. Uh, we're, we're not all going to have uh, blue hats because the sky is falling. Uh, just stay calm. And at the same time, make sure you stay and get healthy. Don't stare at your stocks all day long. Get out, take a walk, go for a run, ride a bike, do something, go to the beach, you know, go and swim, something. Ignore the TV and media experts, right? I know you all love Jim Cramer, but from time to time, just turn off the TV and just ignore what those media experts are saying because most of the time they are just saying what they've been told to say. Reduce and eliminate your debt. Well, I've spoken about that quite a lot. Increase your cash holdings. I just mentioned that a minute ago when I said return some uh, cash to yourself. Exit your higher risk speculative positions, right? You can always look at the PE. Is the PE too high on some of these positions that you're in? Hey, you know, if you're already sitting on a large loss, then maybe you don't want to eat that loss. Uh, but you've got to take into consideration that your loss might become greater. So these are decisions that you need to make, and only you can make that decision. If you purchase the stock yourself, the only person that can exit that position is you. Now, I'm not suggesting you exit the position, because if you just hold on to it, it might recover. But these are things that you need to look at. Don't try and time the market. 
or look for the bottom of the market, you're going to fail. You just can't do it. Invest in companies with good fundamentals that manufacture goods and services that are in demand and ones that preferably pay a healthy dividend. That would be a bonus too, because then you can uh, take that dividend and reinvest it. So the drip, the dividend reinvestment plan allows you to buy some of the uh, stock back while the prices are super low and super cheap. Buy some defensive, stable, large company stocks. You can even uh, park some money in some of the 30 stocks in the Dow. You just need to pick them carefully because uh, there are 30 of them and, and they're not equal. Some are better than others. So if you uh, use the uh, 30 stocks in the Dow as your shopping list, carefully select the one that you want to invest in. Make sure it has good fundamentals. It's got a strong moat, like Warren Buffett has always told us. It manufactures goods and services that are in demand and they are paying a nice healthy dividend. Those, are, those things in themselves are hedges. Celebrate your wins and your large gains like the energy stocks that you hold, right? Not everything is doom and gloom. If you're sitting on a gain like uh, with a stock like Occidental Petroleum, um, you are pretty good. In fact, it might even right size your whole portfolio for you if you're lucky. And you with, without those, you'd be poorer. So celebrate those wins. Don't ignore the fact that you have some stocks that have been performing well. And keep some cash and liquidity on hand to cover expenses just personal expenses for like three to nine months, right? You can't predict what's happening. You cannot predict what will happen in the stock market. You cannot predict whether you're still gonna be employed within the next three months, six months, whatever. You cannot predict these things, you don't know. Sometimes like me, you just have a health scare. You can't predict that either, right? So make sure that you have enough cash on hand to cover your out-of-pocket expenses and your daily living costs uh, and typical everyday expenses, rent, mortgage, you know, food, et cetera for at least three to six months, maybe nine months if you can, depending on uh, where you're at in terms of your age and your life and your earnings and all that kind of stuff. And then you can say, regardless of what the stock market is doing, I have enough cash on hand to give me a little bit of security. Uh, and that in itself is a hedge as well. And tip number 11, which is a bonus, revisit number one above, stay calm, get healthy and take good care of yourself. So guys, this is not a, this is not a complicated story. Uh, it's just an overview of what's happening in the marketplace today. Um, but I need you to, um, to kind of focus uh, on the big picture here. Um, unless you uh, do have a, a very short timeline, in which case you probably shouldn't be too long on too many stocks. Um, you shouldn't panic too much. These things happen. The market goes up, the market goes down. We might go down sub substantially or significantly from the point where we are now. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I don't want to tell you it's good. And I don't want to tell you everything's okay, but at the same time, I don't want you to uh, panic and just take losses and uh, say, hey, I'm out of here. I'm scared. Uh, just give me my cash. I'll take the loss and go away. We don't need to do that, right? Uh, stay calm. Do your due diligence. Do your homework. Look at your stocks individually. If you have a portfolio that uh, has multiple positions, say, is this the one I have to be in or is this the right one for me to be in? Should I take a tax loss here? Can I afford to take a tax loss here? Can I take a little bit of profit here? Whatever. Make those adjustments and don't be shy to, um, to exit some of the positions and take some profit and pay the taxes. It's okay. You know, it's all right. Um, do whatever is right for you. Don't panic. And on that note, this is Mr. Roxy saying thanks for watching. Goodbye for now. See ya.